So yeah, my name is Leandro Parente. I'm from Open Geo Hub, and I will talk about this and uh, the Landsat archive in general, but how really to build a global analysis ready and cloud optimized uh, data. So challenge and implementation strategies. So it's uh, it's a kind of well known that Landsat imagery it's a kind of time machine. So you can have like this long archive. So it's basically the uh, longest running initiative of uh, monitoring for monitoring Earth's uh, land surface. And it's uh, a nice product and you can really use that to trace back and back to the time as a time machine. And, and you have like this different satellite. So they try to keep compatible with uh, every satellite uh, uh, for every launch. And uh, so more recent also, for example, the Landsat 8 and Landsat 9, they were kind of cross calibrated with the Copernicus sensor. So like Sentinel-2 and like recent, you have all these uh, Landsat and Sentinel harmonized collections. So it's quite some effort in this data production. But if you want to really back to the past, you need to actually rely on the Landsat data. And what you can do with that, so this is an example for Brazil. So uh, there is this uh, initiative, like a kind of local initiative uh, led by uh, local universities in the country, so called Map Biomes, and they are doing like annual uh, monitoring for the land cover and land use in the, in the country. And here you can see what happened with the uh, Amazon rainforest. So, and this is uh, basically checking the Landsat data. So you can really trace back to, to for example, 85 in this case. But when you go to the global level, uh, there are some problems. So you have data gaps. So for example, Brazil, Europe, US, you have quite some data for the past, but uh, for uh, like other places like Asia, Africa, and, and, and even like Australia, you have like big data gaps. So from the Landsat 5, 7, and 8, so since 85. So, and not only the gaps are the problem, but also like the, cross calibration, the difference in the sensor. So for example, if you go back to Landsat 5, it's like really like technology from 40 years ago. So, and, and all this data and sensors, they were kind of calibrated and against each other, but it's, it's really difficult to harmonize and it's quite challenging to do this harmonization to allow, for example, machine learning uh, pipelines across the whole archive or like do harmonization to uh, do a temporal uh, time series analysis. So, the, it, so there are some initiatives to do that. And that's kind of the most, the two main initiatives that uh, I, I know so far. So there is this GLAD Landsat R&D that they basically harmonize the whole Landsat archive from Landsat 7, 5, and 8. So they process it in-house and they release it the product. So they cross calibrate it with Moji's data. So basically they release the data, but not the software to do the correction. And there is the force initiative. So it started with the University of Humboldt. And basically here, they also included the Sentinel tool. So you can use force to produce like harmonized collections and so run atmospheric corrections, BRD, AVF corrections. But in this case, you have the software, but you don't have the data. So, and when you really need to do like a global analysis, like with a massive amount of data, it's really difficult, for example, run force like in a continental scale or in a global scale. So that's why, for example, for the effort that I will show here, we are relying on the GLAD Landsat R&D. So when if you think about the remote sensing products, you have different levels. So uh, in general, ESA and USGIS, they deliver a kind of level one, level two. So uh, you with this harmonized uh, collection for Sentinel and Landsat, now they're also delivering gridded uh, and temporal composites with level three. But uh, basically the Landsat R&D delivers like level three product. It's a kind of for every 16 day, they harmonize it, they, they integrated the Landsat five, seven, where there's overlap between the, 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 the satellites and, and Landsat seven and eight, where there's like overlap for in more recent years. And force, it's able to deliver even like level four. They can do like serious interpolation the time and it's quite robust uh, framework. 
So uh, that's a kind of the pipeline of how they did this harmonization. Uh, so basically, in essence, they are relying the modes uh, surface reflectance. They do a kind of per pixel bias, bias adjusted, considering like the, mo the modes reflectance, and they extrapolate it to the past, so still 97. So they also uh, in expanded the Landsat uh, cloud mask, the official one delivered by the USGIS. So I will show some examples. And basically, they provide the API, and you have like the scripts to derive the multi-temporal uh, metrics, and they are delivering 60 days composites for the whole uh, work. So there are some limitations. So if you really need to re do real-time land cover monitoring, they have a kind of one-month delay. So it's not actually like precise uh, land surface reflectance because they don't apply like atmospheric corrections, but uh, it's pretty uh, reliable and usable for uh, suitable for like machine learning uh, pipelines. And more recent, they really, they developed the pipeline for Landsat collection one, but collection one ended in uh, 2021. And now they recomputed the whole collection. They have cloud mask, so, and it's styled. So when we have all these kind of new cloud native formats, and basically that's our, the processing pipeline that we are implementing to uh, kind of harmon the data it's harmonized, but to like aggregate it by temporal uh, composites and deliver a kind of a analysis ready and cloud optimized uh, files. So basically we are removing the clouds considering their cloud mask. We are running a bi-monthly aggregation. I will show some examples of it. For this bi-monthly aggregation, basically we are compressing the temporal resolution so it will reduce the, the kind of the data size also, but we are also reducing the, the format. So the working form uh, in, unassigned integer to byte. So it reduced the data. So, and in, in the end, we also want to run a gap filling and create like global mosaics at 30 meter. So yeah, and here, so we optimized the pipeline. So to process all this data, it will be about like uh, 40, uh, days. So, and this B monthly aggregation plus the global mosaics, we should generate about 406 terabytes. So we want to kind of produce a more, uh, it's, it's not more consistent. Uh, it's more like a kind of uh, compressed version of this archive, but more easy to access and easy to integrate in these kind of uh, different machine learning pipelines. So the, the, the data is there, it's, it's, uh, you can access per tile, for example, but we still need to do a kind of this, all these pre-processing steps depending on the application that you want to run. So when we are testing it, so we defined it a kind of before to run the production, now it's running the production workflow. We executed the, 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 the pipeline for 24 experimental tiles. So here's an example of the cloud uh, mask. So they have all this glass and what is labeled with clear sky, it's basically what we are keeping and, and removing from, so, so we are basically removing the cloudy pixels, shadows and things like that. And so if you remove these pixels, uh, you, you after that we want to do this uh, bi-monthly aggregation. So, and here's an example. So this is like two months of images and we are doing a kind of weighted average to produce something like this. So we want to, compress the data and produce like a seamless time series, like every two months, but without gaps. Here we still have the gaps, so we have a next uh, step to do the gap filling. But the idea here is really combine this for a kind of weighted average considering the, the, uh, the, the kind of the clear sky cover. So for the gap filling, basically we are doing a kind of temporal uh, interpolation. So we developed this method called sysconf. And basically what the sysconf does, it's, uh, it runs a kind of temporal uh, seasonal convolution in the time series. And in essence, gap fill the, 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 all the missing data with observations from different periods, different years, uh, different months, neighborhood months. But it used a kind of weighted strategy to combine it in, in a way that uh, you can uh, gap fill it and have a value for every pixel, but also like a, a quality assessment. So we want to gap fill, put at least some observation there. It's inputted data, but we also want to provide metadata per pixel. 
So in essence, what happens is something like this. So we have the kind of the time series of one pixel here, as example, a lot of missing data. And with this temporal convolution, it's basically a fast Fourier transform uh, operation. We are building this kind of reconstructed time series and we are saving it. So for every pixel of the world, uh, it's implemented in C++ now and the complexity is a log n. And the main uh, advantage of this approach is this kind of uh, weighted vector, we can play with that. So for example, you can define different strategies of gap filling. So for example, in this case, we can use, for example, to gap fill only observations from the past. And doing that, we can have like kind of more uh, control of what uh, the process will generate and depending on the application. So for example, if you are doing the forestation monitor, you don't want to gap fill, for example, the observation using uh, pixels from the future. But if you are doing like crop monitor maybe, and you have a kind of stable areas, you could rely on that because maybe the crops, it's a kind of uh, quite stable in that area. So we can play with that, but uh, in, in the approach, it's quite flexible. So when you can even optimize it for a data-driven approach. So we created this benchmark uh, data set. So to evaluate the quality and the risk of the gap filling, and basically, uh, in this case, in this way, we created artificial gaps and we tested some methods. We are working a publication for it. Everything that we will produce, we want to host in the stack catalog, so in the open land map. So we are aiming to produce these 30 meter mosaics. We don't know if it will be really possible to do it for the global scale, like one single file for the whole world. But uh, if it would not be possible, we want to do at least for continent. We already did, for example, for Europe, and it's available in the Echo Data Cube. So of course, this is also like a valid, valuable uh, data set, and we want to use that uh, in different use case in the Open Earth Monitor, because it's a kind of fundamental data set. So there are different ways to uh, use and to integrate that. So, and for example, uh, in this use case, in the Open Earth Monitor, we are doing like crop yield monitoring system for Africa. We are working together with the uh, IITA. So, and they are, for example, really interested in use this data to do like time series, but also to implement it in a kind of data cube. So for example, uh, in, in nowadays they use a lot of Google Earth Engine, but uh, the approach that we are trying to kind of implement is produce this kind of catalogs with cloud optimized formats and really like flexible ways to access on demand this data. So without any kind of interface or platform hosting the data, it's like client accessing directly the data set. And, and before this, so once we have this data organized, we can run machine learning. So basically, for example, if you want to work in R, you can work with SITs that communicates and it, uh, with several uh, stack catalogs and access these kind of data cubes in different ways. And also uh, we are developing the SignKit map. It's a Python uh, package where we are also uh, putting the connections and even the gap filling approach, everything that we are running at global scale now, it's available and documented in this package. So tomorrow I will present how to build and visualize your own raster data cube. So we'll work with Sentinel uh, to access this data, but the concept is the same. We are basically using the same code, the same routines and methods to uh, process this Landsat data at global scale. So and these are kind of my main takeaways. So this Landsat, it's really the longest running initiative to provide space-based data, like for the uh, Earth's land surface. But to really integrate it in a machine learning pipeline and time series, it requires a lot of harmonization and pre-processing steps. So what we are trying to do is implement it in a kind of generic way. We don't plan to create a kind of, we, we don't believe that this is a silver bullet, but this data could help like different initiatives. But maybe for some application, you still need to go back and process the whole data. So, but if we could uh, attend like multiple initiatives with this data, it's also, I think it, it's really, uh, it's a valid effort. So, and, and really these GLAD Landsat r and they don't provide the ARCO mosaic. So we are working on that to produce temporal aggregated and gap filling the gap filled data. And with this be monthly aggregated, we are kind of compressing this massive amount of data set and we believe that that's a good balance between data size and data usability, because 
if you reduce the data size, of course, you increase the usability because uh, like you don't need like a kind of really serious infrastructure to uh, crunch this data. And also this uh, season conf, so the gap filling approach, it can be customized and fine tuning for different applications. So in the future, we want to kind of train this gap filling method to uh, work per domain considering, and maybe we could do a kind of on-demand gap filled operation, gap filling operation. So that's why we are also saving just the B monthly aggregated without the gap filling because we can play with different gap filling strategies and see what is more suitable for different applications. And in the end, like this cloud native format protocol, so they are the new de facto standard. So we can really use it at full capacity. So there is no reason to not try to generate, for example, a global mosaic with this data, because once you generate these global mosaics, you have like overviews, you have like directly access to the data. And we believe that this can really boost the capacity in, in the earth observation data accessibility and, and data usability in general. Yeah, and, and here I finish my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, 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 that's that's a good point. So uh, we we are kind of aware of some libraries and, but this, what basically this package is doing, of course, we are relying this kind of common libraries. We are basically create a kind of wrapper functions to uh, optimize a bit like instead to, so to create some uh, like helpers and, and functions to access, for example, Rastra.io or um, scikit-learn. And, and for the gap filling, we, we couldn't find like any kind of library in Python. There was some implementations we did test. We tested also in R, but yeah, it's good. I can try to uh, check and, and, and see. Yes, that's a good question. So we we plan to do like, uh, there are some alternatives, but in the end, the data that we want to produce, it's around like 400 terabytes. So I know that uh, inside of the Open Earth Monitor, we are trying to work with some uh, European uh, infrastructure so we could host the data there. But uh, we also use this uh, Wasabi S3. It's a kind of co good cost benefit. So, and now we are expanding it for 100 terabytes. So this is a kind of plan B because it's a commercial company. Of course, would be better like host this data in a uh, kind of European infrastructure. But we definitely, we plan. It's more, uh, I, I don't know the answer of where it will be, but the idea it's it's really like hosted in a way that uh, we can access uh, outside of our internal infrastructure. Thank you so much.